All right, everybody. Hello and welcome to the dedicated show. We have a very special topic and an even more special guest with us today. So you know how everyone is trying to break into the role of a data professional. More specifically, a lot of folks want to become a data scientist. Well, a lot of people end up becoming a data scientist. And in this conversation, we're going to talk to you about what comes next. So you broke into the role of a data scientist. What now? Right. Before I even tell you who we're speaking with, uh, a couple of items I want to tell you about. Number one, this is a live show. So make sure you type in your questions and, and your comments live. We're going to try to take as many questions from the live audience as we can. Obviously, you'll still get a lot of value if you're watching the recording. Uh, but yeah, live is for live questions. A question I had for you as you're joining the session is, are you currently a data scientist or are you trying to break in to the role of a data scientist. If it's neither, uh, feel free not to comment, but I do want to know sort of the majority of the audience, are you already a data scientist and you want to dig deeper into sort of what comes next or are you really just trying to break in uh, into this space? So we can sort of try to cover off both. Uh, can't wait to see what everyone has to say on this. Now, the special guest that we have with us today, her name is Carly Taylor and she is a data scientist for Call of Duty. You guys might be familiar with this game. Uh, if you are, also let us know in the comments. I think it's always uh, fun to see who is familiar with types of uh, things we're going to be talking about. And lastly, before I bring on Carly, we do have a giveaway because this is a dedicated show and I love giveaways. Today, we're giving away two memberships for the dedicated circle. We will announce one winner about halfway through the show and another towards the end. And the way to play is just type in hashtag dedicated trying to uh, keep it simple for you guys today. So I'm going to go ahead and remove that from the screen and bring Carly up on our stage. Hey, welcome to the show. Hey, Kate. Hey, everybody. Hey, hey, hey. So glad that you're able to make time for this. Carly, we do have uh, questions and comments coming in already. But before we get into that, I'll give you the stage to introduce yourself, tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kate. Hey, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Carly. Um, I'm a data scientist and machine learning security strategist at Activision, specifically working on Call of Duty. Um, I'm also an avid poster on LinkedIn, so I might call it a problem. <laughs> but I would say that uh, I love to help people uh, envision themselves in careers in gaming, uh, think about how to break into gaming, and then also tie that together with my first love, which is data science. Awesome. I love it. Thanks for sharing that. And let's hear a bit more about your background. How did you become a data scientist? So my background is actually in chemistry. Um, I was working in a lab. I was in academia, you know, kind of feeling burnt out, hating my life, um, doing the nine to five in a lab, making $15 an hour, like minimum wage. Ooh. Yeah, it was rough. And I, I just started to hear rumblings at that time from my friends who were going into this career field called data science, but I had never heard of it. Um, and a lot of people I knew who had studied chemistry and physics were going to work for fintech companies and do like quantitative trading. And I was like, that's so cool. Um, a lot of the skills we used in chemistry and in computational chemistry could be applied to that. And it was awesome to be noticed that those skills were transferable. Um, and so I just, I really started to look into the viability of completely changing my career and pivoting to data science and it worked out for me, luckily. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I always love hearing people's journeys because a lot of people didn't start out in, you know, they didn't learn data science in college, right? Exactly. So you, you were a chemistry major. So how did you actually make the switch into data science? So I tried on my own for a little while. Um, I will say that I'm not the best at self-guided learning. So I was doing my best to try to like tailor my resume and I was trying to figure out like, what do people in tech want? You know, like my resume had always been tailored to work in a lab. I had no idea what a, like a science, like a data science resume should even look like. Yeah. Um, and so I, I broke into the analyst level, which was awesome. I got to see, you know, how businesses functioned. I had never worked outside of academia really, and kind of learn more of the business acumen, but I couldn't make that next step into data science, no matter how hard I tried. Um, and so I actually ended up quitting my job just like cold turkey. It was so wow. scary. <laughs> and I did a three month boot camp over a summer and it was really hard and scary. And yeah, it was a wild time. 
<laughs> wow, that's that's an amazing story. Thank you for sharing that. Now, boot camps um, can be great for people mm -hmm. who can take the three months and focus yes. and actually have that. You need that self discipline, right? Because yes. it's not self guided learning anymore, where you have someone sort of telling you what to learn, but it's still you. No exactly. one's going to just download. Yep. Yeah, at least we can't download the <laughs> Sign me up first. <laughs> right. I think I think we're we're going to come to that maybe in 10, 20 years, <laughs> where we don't need school and just download. But yeah, you have to sit down there in summer. I mean, that's like a tough time to sit down and study. So tell us more about how you chose the boot camp and maybe some pros and cons of going that route. Yeah. So I actually chose the boot camp because I had a friend that went there. And so, you know, he had found it pretty straightforward to find a job. You know, I didn't know at that time that like he was actually pretty lucky, but I just saw, you know, like it's a lot of money up front, but it seems like it paid off for this person that I know and trust. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up just taking a leap, leap of faith that, you know, like betting on myself that I could do it too. Um, and it, it worked out for me. I would say, you know, the obvious big con of a boot camp is the cost. I think my boot camp was eighteen thousand dollars, all said and done. So it was extremely expensive. Um, now I will say I made that back in my first salary bump as a, a data scientist from my previous job, mm -hmm. but that's not a guarantee, you know. And I think some boot camps now are trying to do like placement guarantees, and they'll take off money if you don't get a job. I would definitely read the fine print of that before I signed up because I feel like there's probably a catch somewhere. Um, and so, you know, I think for the kind of people who think that you know they have the inner drive to do this themselves and learn it themselves. There was nothing at the boot camp that wasn't available online for free um, mm -hmm. or even for like cheaper. Uh, mm -hmm. But it was a structured environment where I was with other people who were doing the same thing. And it was in person too. It was before the pandemic. And I think that helped me kind of get that community. I still talk to those people. Um, was it an $18,000 community, you know, that's for each person to decide. I feel like it was worth it because it worked out for me. If right. it hadn't, I would feel differently, you know? Yes, absolutely. That's a lot of money. But when you think about, let's say, going back to school for a four-year degree, uh -huh. you're going to be paying more than $18,000, right? Yes. So it could end up being worth it if if you're self-disciplined, if you push through yes. it. I think a lot of people do give up almost halfway yes. through. They're like, oh, that's not really working out. And then yeah. they lose the money and then they say, oh, boot camps are not great. Yeah. I didn't succeed. Yeah. Yes. So it's like, yeah, well, you didn't really do everything you're supposed <laughs> to, right? <That's> yeah. <laughs> you have to be willing to commit hardcore and you have to be willing to go for it. Um, yeah. And it was, yeah, I mean, I definitely committed and, and made it work, but I don't know. I also had a master's degree already in a quantitative field. And so mm -hmm. the boot camp, I think, was like the, the cherry on top of my education, I wouldn't recommend a boot camp in lieu of like getting a bachelor's degree. Um, I right. still think that that's a very important step, especially in a competitive job market. Mm -hmm. I have talked to some people straight out of high school who are like, I think I want to do a boot camp instead. And I'd say, don't do that. Definitely get like an, an accredited degree from somewhere first. Yes. And then a boot camp can be a good supplement, but it's expensive. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And I'm just looking into... Uh, the comments now. So Avery Smith, uh, he says he was also making $15 in the chem lab before. <laughs> Avery, we've talked about this before. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, I don't Scott miss those days, Avery. Scott, Scott now calls you you're his cousin because he has last, <laughs> same, same last name. Last <laughs> and I think same with Ben as well. Uh, I see yeah. Michael here. It's uh, He's here from your old stomping ground in sunny Colorado. All right. Oh, the snow. Yeah. <laughs> So as as you guys are joining the session, make sure you're asking Carly questions. She will she will take as many as we can in the next rapid fire 30, 40 minutes. Yeah, rapid fire. Keep them coming. Um, so I love I love the feedback on the boot camps. Now let's assume a lot of people sort of commented that they're either in data science or or trying to get in. It looks like the majority are already in data science. Now let's assume that we're talking to data scientists right now. Okay. They've entered the field by a school boot camp or maybe even the citizen data scientist where they just sort of got groomed into that role. What can they do to to level up? How do they actually get promoted to maybe the next level, the senior data scientist? 
Yeah, I love this question. I spend a lot of time um, just for my own career and for the people that I now lead, thinking about what it takes to get to that next level, right? Um, and I kind of break this down in my mind into four steps. The first step is you have to bring value, right? There's no shortcut to success. Um, you need to be productive, technically competent, solving problems for people, right? Like the, just the baseline thing of what it takes to be a good data scientist, you need to do your job well, right? Um, I'd say the second thing is that you need to show your value. And a lot of us aren't very good at this because we're not used to having to do it. Um, I would say that the best way to show your value is to start teaching others. Um, I think a lot of us have a lot to give and a lot to teach and a lot to mentor. You can teach other data scientists. You can help out where you can. You can even teach your stakeholders a little bit about data science, right? There's no reason that data science should be this like confusing, abstracted um, practice. It should be at the basic level, easy for you to explain what you're doing and your results to your stakeholders and help them feel smarter and empowered. Like, hey, I, this data stuff's not that hard to understand. You know, I get it. I work in marketing, but I could also understand these, you know, complicated machine learning techniques. Um, and I think that will help you show your value to others. I'd say the third thing is that you definitely need to discuss your value, right? You need to be discussing your wins with your manager. Mm -hmm. As your manager has more and more people to take care of and to mentor and to look after, you know, those small wins might not be as noticeable to them in the day to day. So when a stakeholder gives you really good feedback and says you're doing awesome, or when someone calls you out in a big meeting and says that like your work is incredible, right? Like write those things down, be ready to discuss them later in your one-on-one -on -one and be like, hey, wasn't it awesome that Jane said that our work was incredible? Like, I love to hear that. I love to feel like I'm bringing value. Um, I would also say write down all of your wins and successes through the year. We all probably do self-reviews at the end of the year. And that's your time where you think back and you're like, oh my God, what did I do this year? That it shouldn't be like an end of year crunch. You should have a document ready to go with all the little things that you feel like were successful through the year. So you're just copying and pasting straight from that. So it's not like an exercise and trying to remember because here's a long time. <laughs> yes, it is. And then I'd say the last thing is to leverage your value, right? So even if you're doing all the right things, a promotion isn't a guarantee. There can be budget cuts. There can be other people up for promotion. There could be a timing situation. So you really need to come to your end of year discussion whenever promotions typically happen for you and be ready to discuss how you met all of the level goals for the next mm -hmm. level and how you're gonna continue to bring and drive value. Um, and be ready to negotiate. And if it doesn't work out, sometimes it doesn't. Like I've been passed up for promotions before. And you know what I did? I got a promotion by going to another company. Now, sometimes that's, that's a much bigger promotion, right? It was way, way bigger promotion anyway than I would have gotten. So yes, I would say like that's, if you love your job, that can be like the nuclear option. Mm -hmm. But to move up in your career, you need to be willing to move around and get out of your comfort zone and try new things. And I would say staying somewhere too long early on, especially if they're not promoting you and seeing your value, can really be a detriment to your career, especially as you watch your peers move jobs and get promotions and make more money and kind of level up that way. So how long would you say is too long? <sighs> so as a junior data scientist, I wouldn't stay somewhere for longer than a year. A year. That, oh, okay. Yeah. Very I, think as, I mean, you can stay longer than a year, but if you're not promoted out of yeah. junior level within a year, move on. I'd say that that's a standard amount of time. Don't stay at a junior level for two, three years, right? Like six months to a year, honestly, is like the max amount of time I would spend at that level. Mid-level, you know, two, two years, I'd say is fair. Yeah. Um, to get your feet under you. If you're a high performer and you're driving value after two years, you know, you should be pushing hard for that senior level position. If not, you should be leveraging your network and trying to move somewhere where you can get a senior level position. Um, now, this is based on my experience in a job market that's different than today. In the past mm -hmm. six months, things have changed dramatically. Yeah. So you might have to back off of how aggressive you are. Um, but I tend to default on being extremely aggressive yeah. about my career because like, you know, it's my life. What do I have to lose? And like, exactly, I want right? to move up, you know, I want to move on and get more, uh, get more money and get more, uh, like experience, you know, like, why not? Absolutely. I agree. I, it just brings me back probably nine, 10 years, maybe more, <laughs> a long time ago when I was, um, I was offered a new job 
And I remember going to my husband, I'm like, hey, so I'm offered this job, but I've only been at this space for about a year. Yeah. Okay. Early on, a year was sort of my mark. It's like, okay, August. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> literally August every time. And he's like, and I told him that, you know, some people told me not to look for another job or I even entertain the opportunity, even though it was a really good one, yeah. because it would look bad on a resume. Um, and he was like, okay, aren't you getting a job offer? Like, what do you care about a resume? And I'm like, eh, that's a good point. I ended up taking that job. I um, think he's right. right. Yeah, exactly. The market will tell you if your resume isn't hireable, right? Yeah. And if someone's offering you a job, they're offering you a job. I'd never say uh, no unless it was a bad offer. Yes, absolutely. So I'll just recap for, for those who might have missed it. So tips for promotions and leveling up. It's all value, all right? You bring value, you show your value, you discuss your value, and you leverage your value. So um, I love that. And we have a, a question here that I guess leads us into how do we actually get value? Um, so Amit's asking, there are quite a few resources such as boot camps for beginners to intermediate data scientists, but not uh, not so for intermediate to advanced. So what resources do you recommend to level up your skills to advance so you can actually show even more value? I would say, you know, this is an interesting question because I don't think that the trajectory from junior data scientist to like lead data scientist is all skills based. I'd say that it's a it's probably a hockey stick curve where you're learning a lot of technical skills in your junior and mid-level, probably even into senior, where you're learning how to leverage those skills that you've learned and technical skills, I mean. By senior level, I'd say there's not a huge gap in technical aptitude to lead. You really kind of level out unless you're doing advanced algorithmic research and you're working on an R&D team that's building new algorithms or implementing like hardcore research. The skill set that you need at a lead, it's not like you're going to know more about a random forest. Like it's how you leverage what you know and how you bring up others around you and use what you know to help the business. And the biggest differentiator I see between like a senior level and a lead level, maybe even a principal level, is how they integrate into the business. And that business acumen becomes 10 times more important than your coding skills, for example. Now, that's not to say that you can just, you know, be a complete noob and like schlep it around and write terrible code, right? Like you always need to be improving and implementing best practices. And if something new comes around, learn about it, right? Upskill that way, stay on top of trends. Mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't say there's like, you know, you need to start developing your own algorithms and publishing papers to get to that next level at most jobs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess it's not more of the technical skills, learning even more algorithms or, you know, creating new ones, like you said. I guess it's more of what most people call it, the soft skills. Exactly. And exactly. you mentioned integrating in, with the business. So maybe talk a little bit more what you mean by that. So this is something that I overlooked early in my career, right? When I was first starting, I felt a little bit overlooked because I had this background, I had a master's degree in computational chemistry, and I felt like I was competing against people who had an MBA. And I was like, we're just different. We're so different in our skill sets, right? Like I can do all this crazy advanced math. I have all these advanced analytics skills. But what I didn't realize is that those people with the MBA could run laps around me in meetings and in contextualizing work. And they still can. I have so many friends with MBAs and I'm like, teach me all you know. They build the best decks. They tell the best stories. They contextualize things well. And you can't forget, as data scientists, we're always solving business problems. This is mm. what we do. We, we're not here to do research for the sake of research. Again, very few roles are like that unless you're working in an R&D department that does this. 99% of us are working to help make a business make more money. And that's the bottom line. If you can't contextualize your work, you've already kind of lost. And so I would start taking, and I've, I've started doing this, taking more MBA level courses, mm -hmm. trying to understand how does finance, how do financial projections work? What's a PL? What are we looking at when, when we're in our quarterly earnings statement? Um, for if you're in a publicly traded company. Mm -hmm. How can I better understand what drives the backbone of this business, which is oftentimes finance, marketing, um, and understand how I fit into that big picture. And I'd say that those skills are oftentimes way more important at that level than how well you can code. Yeah, I agree. And 
you know, so you mentioned telling stories, building decks. That's something that a uh, data scientist is probably not learning in school, no. right? Uh, they might learn a little bit about building decks for maybe a final presentation, yeah. but that's usually not the focus. Yes. Kind of like uh, an afterthought. Okay, let's just throw this in a PowerPoint. Yeah. <laughs> now I use Canva, so I can't even use PowerPoint. Oh, I love Canva. <laughs> yes. So what tips do you have for folks who, are, who want to learn more skills like telling stories, um, building decks, and maybe even talk about stakeholder management and actually engaging with the business. Listen to the people who do it well. There's going to be someone at your company who you see and you just know when you listen to them, like this person does this well, their decks are put together well, they weave a narrative that's easy to follow, and they use evidence to support whatever they're trying to achieve, right? Mm -hmm. Start listening to those folks. If there's not someone at your company, there's probably someone in your network who you know who's really good at this. Yeah. Um, I would say that also for data scientists, salespeople are your friends. Salespeople have mastered the art of listening to people when they talk and mm -hmm. truly hearing what they need, not what they're telling you that they need. They're experts at hearing people's pain points and ad ad ugh, addressing them. So you want to be able to do that as well, because everything that you're doing, you're trying to go up against someone else is asking for money. Someone else is asking for time. There's always some other something in the business that's competing for resources. So you right. need to think about every interaction that you have is you trying to address someone else's pain point. Um, and stakeholders, it's the exact same thing. They'll tell you, oh, we need, you know, something that will help us read our emails faster. Okay, well, why? What's going on? Well, we actually get a lot of automated emails that end up being too much to read and we can't cut through the noise. Oh, so you don't really need something to read your emails. You need someone to figure out what's breaking upstream and yeah. why you're getting overwhelmed. You need a better spam filter or something. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so when you start to actually understand their issues and mm. you hear where they're coming from, and then you bring a data-driven solution to them and say, this is what I'm thinking. How does that sound? Mm -hmm. Bring them into the conversation. This helps lift you up. It lifts your stakeholders up. It makes them feel heard. Everyone wants to feel like their problems are heard, right? Like, Consider yourself part data scientist and part therapist. <laughs> like you're here. I've heard that before, actually. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and yeah, I how that's do, how do you feel way. about that? You know? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds really frustrating. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I, I love the part where you ask why, right? So mm -hmm. they think they want X, but yes. asking three Ys usually gets you to a whole different problem. And 100%. That you can actually solve. 100%. I love it. All right, let's take a question from the audience here. Um, what knowledge from your chemistry background helped you in your data science career? And if you have any specific examples, please share. For sure. Um, memorizing the Grignard reaction didn't help. I will say that. <laughs> <laughs> All of the uh, organic chemistry, not helping. No, um, no, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. Actually, maybe with like, here's how to memorize a lot of information really fast. <laughs> uh, I'd say just, I mean, any hard science degree, you're going to have to learn the science part, right? And I think that the science sec part of data science is often overlooked. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was Daliana recently who was posting about this and how to bring the science back into data science. Science is a way that you approach a problem, right? Like there is a scientific method for how we discover solutions to problems, how we frame our problems, how we frame our hypotheses. Um, I would say that that was probably the most helpful. Mm -hmm. And then specifically from my master's degree was how to handle self-driven research and self-guided research. Because a lot of what we do as data scientists, there's no playbook for here's how long it should take in the discovery phase. Here's how long it should take in the implementation phase. Um, I think this is a, a big reason why there's a lot of conflict with data science teams and like sprint planning and JIRA driven teams, right? That try to do like scrum it's really hard to break down a research problem into like a scope of work that's like, okay, this part has to take two weeks. Mm -hmm. like you don't really know until you're in the problem exactly what's gonna unfold, right? It's not like fixing a bug. It's more in depth than that. I think there's people that do this well and it can work. But if you're trying to do a, a standard two week sprint for data science, you're gonna come up against this kind of problem where you're like, you can't two week sprint plan research. 
And I think doing my own research at an academic level helped me understand how to plan out long-term research projects, how to check in with someone, you know, periodically, it came my advisor and figure out like, am I on track and how to like uncover things that you can't Google, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of our job is super Googleable. I am on Stack Overflow all day. I know. Um, but there's some parts that aren't because people haven't seen it. They're not specific to like your domain and you're just going to have to get creative. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that creative problem solving probably came from my background. Yeah. And I think it's also learning how to learn, right? So if you if yes. learn something as difficult as chemistry, something after that, like data science is probably, okay, cool. <laughs> I, can, I can do that. <laughs> um, all right. So we're going to announce our first winner. I'm going to share my screen Yay! quickly. So hashtag dedicated to play. Quick reminder for those who don't know how to play. So if you're joining us on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, or Twitch, just type in hashtag dedicated. And what you're winning today is, let me hide it for a bit. You're winning um, membership to the dedicated circle, which has courses on Tableau, Python, R, um, Tipco. There are like 10 courses. Data story, storytelling. Storytelling nice. is on there. <laughs> One of the Data important things. Storytelling skills. is great. Yes. Uh, and then we also have a discussion board that um, you can talk to other data professionals. So, all right, I'm going to draw the first winner and then we're, we are going to draw again towards the end of the show. So if you see your name up there with confetti, just reach out to me and I'll make sure to get you access. All right, Ariel. Yay. Yay. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. We'll roll this again towards the end. Um, we had questions coming in. Let me see. And they're coming in fast. I already lost which one I wanted, but maybe let's take this one from Saurabh. So how helpful are your data science skills in gaming product management, or let's just say gaming industry, right? So how have you leveraged your data science skills there? So it's really interesting. I made a post about this recently. There are so many opportunities to use data science in gaming. It's not even funny. Um, there are points of contact with players that you don't even necessarily think about until you're playing a game. So we have storefronts that are perfect for recommenders. Um, we have a huge number of users. Maybe you want to predict when you think they're going to churn. Maybe you want to figure out who you think they are so you can give them better challenges or better daily um, messaging so that you can get them more into the game, help them uncover parts of the game maybe they're not, they don't know about that they could be super interested in. Um, my specific part of data science is more in the anomaly detection. So, you know, we have all sorts of people all over the world doing different things at different times. Um, and you need to make sure that your platforms are secure, that your data is secure, and that there's no anomalous behavior going on behind the scenes. Um, and then specifically in the product management section, I would say that most data scientists need to be somewhat familiar with product um, and product teams. I actually worked on a product team at a prior role. Um, and you know, the product teams are the backbone of what we all do, right? Like if you work at a company that makes a product, like these people are the ones driving it, figuring out what features are going in next. Um, and they're often going to come to you to help figure out like, what might our users want? You know, what are they doing with the product now? What do we think that the next set of users are going to want in the product? And so yeah. I think that that's super helpful too. So be be best friends with the product people and the salespeople, right? Just yeah. be best friends with everyone. Be best friends with everybody. You just want to be everyone's friend. You want to be the helpful person. <laughs> and now you'd be best friends with everyone. I got two yep. insights. I love it. <laughs> A uh, question from Michael, how would you manage up differently if your manager is a data scientist versus an MBA? Yeah, I actually have had an amazing manager who wasn't a data scientist and I've had another amazing manager who was. I think as a data scientist, it's probably sometimes easier when your manager also has been through the exact roles that you've worked in, right? So like they've been in your shoes, they can understand. They know like the name of the game and, and kind of the ropes of the level. But there's also something to be said about having a manager who isn't a data scientist who can give you a different perspective on problems. So I would just leverage their expertise differently. Um, managing up to another data scientist is fairly straightforward because you can get technical with them. You can ask them very technical questions about your models um, and you can get really good feedback about not only your performance as a stakeholder, but your technical aptitude as well and get areas for growth. 
-hmm. Having a manager who's an MBA is going to be a little bit different, but I think just as useful. I mean, you get a completely different perspective on how you're performing in terms of the greater business unit, on how they see your growth in terms of business acumen, how you're driving value to someone who might not be in your day-to-day -day world. And 90% of the people you interact with are not data scientists. So how non-data scientists perceive you is oftentimes going to be way more important than how other data scientists perceive you in terms of your career. Okay. Very interesting. Yeah. I guess it goes back to stakeholder management and making sure mm -hmm. that you're aware of the skill sets, the knowledge that those people have that yeah. you interact with and changing your communication strategy with them as well, right? Exactly. You're going to exactly. say different things to different people. Yes, <laughs> yes. You don't want to get into the weeds, especially, I mean, with your uh, manager who's not technical with anyone, right? Yes. Like, what's the point? You might sound smart in the moment and feel like, yeah, I'm really showing them how, how much I know. But really what you're doing is a little bit of alienating yourself and seeming un like not approachable Yeah. when you get too in the weeds, right? We don't really need to get deep into things most I of the time. Completely agree. The more you try to sound smarter, especially than mm -hmm. your manager, the worse it can get. For you. Yes. <laughs> yes. You don't want to confuse them. I mean, maybe no. train them, like you said in the beginning, training them and maybe explaining some of the concepts. Yes. It's better yes. off than just trying to make them feel like, what is she yes. talking about? Oh, she's so smart, but I have no idea what yes. she's saying. <laughs> yep. The best teachers take complex topics and make them easy to understand and make everyone feel smarter, not just Absolutely. themselves feel smarter. Yes. Absolutely. So we talked about stakeholder management. I want to shift over to project management because I think a lot of what data scientists do is, is project management. So I wanted to ask your thoughts on how does that fit in into the, I guess, daily life of a data scientist? Yeah. Um, being able to manage your own research and self-guide your projects is critical to getting to the next level as a data scientist. Um, from my perspective, if you're at a junior level or even early mid-level data science career, you know, you're going to get help with that day-to-day -day project management, or maybe as a mid-level, you'll have bi-weekly check-ins to see how your projects are going. When you really want to get up to that next level, senior, lead, and above, you need to be showing that you can manage your projects, deliver on time, add some structure into what is inherently kind of an unstructured process, and drive your value that way. Um, I think it is hypercritical to showing how good you are as a data scientist. Um, if you spin your wheels trying to get 1% more accuracy out of a model for three months, that's not driving value and that's not managing your project time wisely. You know, there's a concept of an MVP in business, your minimum viable product. You need to be always driving towards the best thing you can deliver as quickly as possible because you don't, the last thing you want is for people to lose interest in your solution because it took too long. Yeah. Um, and project management means regular check-ins with your stakeholders. Keep them up to date on where things are going. Give them realistic timelines for deliverables. Give them interim, interim deliverables deliverables, sorry. Yeah. If you can send them like, here's a sample CSV of what I'm going to be outputting as like a table in X months. Does this work? Are these the right columns? Is this the right data? Is this the format you want to see? Yeah. Um, even those small check-ins can keep you on track, can keep them interested and keeps everyone on the same page so that you're not having someone call you in three months and be like, whatever happened to that big project you were working on? That's yeah, or six months later, more. right? Show <laughs> yeah. up and say it worked for six months of this. And you're like, I don't, I don't want this. Like, yeah, they're like the problem has changed already. You took too long. <laughs> I forget, I forget the game, but there was actually a computer game, and I forgot who told me this. I need to like brush up on where this happened because it's such a fun example. They hired uh, some sort of data science programming team to do something for their game, and months later they come back. The lead data scientist is presenting, and he's like. Well, you know, we found out that this character is actually a lot more strong, it has more strength power than these characters. It's an anomaly, we've uncovered it. And they were like, yeah, that is built that way. Like, we know this, we made the game <laughs> on purpose this way. Like, <laughs> that was a great example of why you should keep keep the lines open, you know? Yes, keep it, yes. Keep it flowing. I've seen many projects fail because people are working outside of the context of like their actual stakeholders reality, right? It's like, yeah such a shame you don't want that <laughs> um so since we're talking about gaming juan has a question how much do you play call of duty in a week oh my gosh um 
Anyone from Activision watching? <laughs> <laughs> Outside of your work schedule. Obviously, Carly. <laughs> um, I would, I probably am on, I'd say at least, um, it's launch season. So I'm on a lot more, but I'm, I'm testing things right now. Mm-hmm. So I'd say at least probably two hours a week on the weekends. I'll try to hop on as well and get a couple hours in. Um, but right now it's less playing for fun and more playing to test. Okay. Um, but I'm also still playing for fun. <laughs> okay, so where do you spend more time playing games or on LinkedIn? Uh, probably LinkedIn, to be completely honest, yeah. <laughs> because I can like get on LinkedIn in between meetings and stuff. Playing yeah. video games in between meetings is a little harder because I get sucked in and then I'll miss a meeting and then I have to be yeah. like, hey, sorry. Oops. I was playing domination. I was trying to capture B. I lost track of time. <laughs> Luckily, the people I work with would be like, I understand. Completely. Oh, I get it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, all right, moving in, we're, we'll take like four or five questions from the audience before we wrap. So let's just rapid fire these. So Harsh wants to know, starting to learn data science, where, where should he start? Uh, Harsh, I would start with some free online resources. Um, if you're not totally sure this is the career for you and you're not really sure what, you know, what's the big deal about data science, start learning yourself for free. If it is for you, then you can make decisions about maybe doing some sort of paid class, going to get a master's degree, maybe going back to school, doing a boot camp. There's so many options ahead of you. Mm-hmm. But for like, I'm not even sure yet, free learning is your friend. Yeah, you know, there are so many resources available. I remember my niece was trying to break into data science and she was looking at boot camps and they were also okay. quite expensive. Um, and she's like, yeah, I want to do it, but I think I need a boot camp because she didn't trust herself to just sit okay. down and do it. Whereas I'm more of a, I want to do it myself and sort yeah. of have this badge of like, look, I pulled all the resources <laughs> and did it myself and I do have the self-discipline if the goal is worth it. Yes. Um, but I guess knowing yourself and admitting it. You should <laughs> definitely admit the truth to yourself. Yes. You want to do it. <laughs> um, okay, this is going to be fun. So Scott, your cousin, has a chemistry question. Oh, my God. <laughs> you don't have to answer this. I just wanted to see, what do you call a ring of Fe plus two ions? Hold on. You see, I don't know if this is supposed to be a joke or if this is an actual question. Iron two? Iron plus I don't two. know. I don't know. Scott, please tell what us. What is it, Scott? <laughs> uh, we'll move over to Saurabh for now. Uh, do the online courses in data science help you in getting a data science role? So you talked about boot camps, but they're also one-off courses. Like I know Andrew Jones in the audience has his data science infinity, which actually is more of a boot camp awesome program. Classes. Yeah. But maybe one-off courses like Learn R or Learn How to Apply Python to dashboarding. What are your thoughts on those? I think that they can be super helpful as long as what you're doing is in the context of something that you need to like complete a project or Mm. fill in a gap on your resume. So let's say that, you know, you're working and you know that you have like a huge blind spot when it comes to unsupervised learning, Um, taking a course to address what you know is a deficiency in yourself, super, super, super helpful. Um, Taking a course just to put it on your resume, maybe not because tons of people have courses on their resume from Coursera and you know, what ends up differentiating you at that level, I'd say, are your projects and your ability to discuss what you've learned and not just putting a certificate or a course on your resume. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I highly recommend. I remember Avery was in the audience as well. He's very project driven. I think he has like Avery is super project driven. Yes, We've talked about that a lot. I love that approach because it gives you something tangible to talk about in an interview. Yeah. Um, whereas it's... a lot of early career data scientists, they might have projects, but they're all the same one on like the Titanic Irish data set and or Titanic. The Irish and, data yeah. set, right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, oh, Scott's followed up. It's a Ferris wheel. <laughs> There we go. It's, it's a chemistry humor. Thank you, Scott. All right, moving into another question here. Okay, so R- Roman's asking, where should I pay most attention to if moving from product analytics to data science? Um, that's interesting because I moved. The job I quit when I went to boot camp was as a product analyst. Okay. Um, I would say that 
the product analyst is like a great role that's like very central to the company. I loved doing that job because I felt like I was help I was like right in the middle of engineering, product, marketing, like it was an awesome place to be to learn. Mm -hmm. The biggest differentiator for me was upskilling in Python. Um, mm -hmm. I was very good when I was a product analyst, and this might be true for you as well, that I could do backward looking analyses very well. Like how, why did we perform well in Q2? What were our users doing? What did they want? Um, but I couldn't do predictive mm -hmm. modeling. Okay. What do we think they're going to want in Q3? You know, yeah. like that was the disconnect for me. Mm -hmm. And that's where I needed Python to upskill in Python. And I needed to learn machine learning and how to do predictive modeling. And that was the next step for me. Okay. Interesting. So the boot camp that you took, was that in Python or was that R or something? It else? was, yeah. Yeah, it was Python. a Python based boot camp. Yeah. Okay, but then you just wanted to level up, so you invested more. Yeah, I had already used um, Python in my master's degree. So, like, okay. we doing computational chemistry, a lot of what we did was in Python, and then the mm. rest was in Fortran, which I don't recommend. Um, and so, like, I knew that leaving product analytics, I was like, I'm going to need to learn. I mean, R or Python, pretty, you know, interchangeable from that perspective, yeah. but I need to learn how to leverage like a programming language to be mm -hmm. more efficient at my job and to actually implement some of these like predictive modeling things that I want to do. Awesome. This leads us perfectly. This rarely happens into our next question <laughs> for Juan. So he's a data analyst, wants to move to Python and more advanced coding. So maybe you could share some of your tips of how you actually leveled up with Python. Um, yes. So I started by just messing around with like free Python tutorials online and trying to get a feel for, um, you know, here's how you build a list comprehension. Here's some of the terms. Um, and then that's when I decided I needed a boot camp because I needed someone to force me to write Python for eight hours a day for three months straight. <laughs> and it, it was very, very helpful. Yeah. Um, but I would say that there are tons of courses out there to just learn Python. But Python is just a piece of the puzzle. Right. Like Python's just a programming language. It's what it's how you use it that will differentiate you. And mm -hmm. so you need not only like the programming skills to get you to the next level, but you need to be able to understand why you're doing the certain things you are with Python and machine learning or with R. Right. Like you don't just learn R, you learn R and statistics so that you can do better statistical analyses. So you don't just learn Python and how to import SK Learn. You yeah. learn Python and then you learn the fundamentals and mm -hmm. like doing those two things together are really what are going to make you like a data scientist in my opinion. Right. Actually solving a problem with your exactly. skills. Yeah. Uh, all right. Follow up question from Juan. What's the name of that boot camp if you're willing to share? They actually closed. So mm -hmm. it was Galvanize. Oh, I heard of Galvanize. Okay. Uh -huh. I didn't know they closed. And then they bought, uh, they, they closed their data science specific boot camp, I think. So mm -hmm. they bought a hack reactor. And so I'm pretty sure that the hack reactor program is still going. Um, okay. So they do like a, a software engineering boot camp. Mm -hmm. But last time I checked, they're not doing their data science only boot camp anymore, which is sad because it was awesome. Yes. Okay. Well, it sounds awesome from what you're saying. Um, all right. Before we take our last one or two questions, I just wanted to remind folks the hashtag dedicated. We're going to roll our last giveaway in like two minutes as we wrap Yay. up. So question from George. She says, as a data scientist, what is the thing that you look forward to doing every morning? Um, right now, probably playing Call of Duty. <laughs> <laughs> As a data scientist, right? <laughs> True. As a data scientist, uh, that's as a, a general nerd. Um, as a data <laughs> scientist, I look forward to actually checking the outputs of my models. So I've got a lot of things running in production and I love like checking all my dashboards every morning and seeing like what kind of things happened overnight, what kind of things we're finding um, and just kind of nerding out on the actual results of all the things I built. Okay, awesome. And we had a question come in earlier from Michael around value. So um, you talked about demonstrating value. So I guess you wanted some specifics in terms of how do you actually demonstrate value on a daily basis? Um, so I don't think it's like doing EDA in N minutes. It's not something that's like you need to get that quantified. Um, mm -hmm. I think demonstrating value is all about how you're perceived, right? And so it's not just I was able to code this or solve this problem in a short amount of time. That certainly is a piece of it, right? Like being able to be efficient at your job and showing value in like your technical aptitude, that's a piece of it. 
I would say though, that the biggest part about how valuable you are is how you're perceived. And so Mm -hmm. your value needs to be driven from a perspective of this is how my stakeholders view me. This is how I integrate into the business. And these are the problems that I've solved in the context of the business. And like, that is where the value comes from. No one cares that you, you know, wrote something in two lines of code that Stack Overflow took three. Right. I love what you said about value and it's all about how you're perceived because that's really what it is, right? Yeah. That's and that that gets me like I want to do a whole hour session now on personal branding and how you <laughs> how you're perceived. I know we're running out of time here, so I'll wrap up. Uh, we'll do the giveaway and then I'll ask you my final question. So let's see. Congrats again to Ariel. Let's roll this again. And get all right, all right, all right. Second winner. We need a drum roll, right? <laughs> Every time this happens, I'm like, we need a drum roll here. Hannah. Hannah. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> All right, please follow up with me after the show and I'll make sure to get you access. Now, Carly, my favorite question to ask as we wrap up is where people can go to continue the conversation because the comments and questions are just flowing in like every second. (laughs) I love this. Yeah, thank you all so much for your participation. This has been so fun. Um, You can find me at Carly Taylor on LinkedIn. So search me. I've got my little slot machine in my name. Uh, I think it's Carly Taylor 0017 at LinkedIn. I don't know. Just look in the search bar. You'll find me. It's fine. (laughs) Carly Taylor. Um, Yes. Anywhere else that they can go? Uh, I have a website rebeldatascience.com R-E-B-E-L and you can also find like some of my appearances on there and just some of the things I love to post about and a little bit more about me. And you can also book time to chat with me. You know, I'm around, but you know, come into the comments on my posts. We have a good time. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Now I'm wondering how you got that domain name, Rebel Data Science. It was available. It was, it was available? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I know. I That's bought it on Squarespace. Well, I guess, you know, I use them to buy it. It was like 20 bucks. It was crazy. Wow. That's amazing. Well, congrats on that. That's cool. Thanks. <laughs> well, anyways, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. This is a, we're wrapping up the dedicated show. We might have one more show this year. We might not. I thought this was final until someone messaged me last night saying, we need to do a show. So we'll see what happens. But thank you so much for the support throughout the year. And Carly, thank you so much for being a guest on the show. Thank you, Kate. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. All right. We'll see you online. Thanks for joining.